Thank you everyone for joining us today. Is meeting number 11 of the M2 G2 series. Um, we are very happy and excited to host uh, Clemens today. He'll be talking about his work um, during his PhD. A bit more about Clemens before we, we start. Clemens is a third year PhD student in the group of Prof. Uh, Gisbert Snyder at the UTH uh, Zurich. And he is currently doing an internship in the computer assisted drug design group at Novartis. After his undergrad studies in chemical engineering, he, got, he first got into chemoinformatics and machine learning for drug discovery during his, ma his master's degree at MIT, working with Connor Coley and Krauss Jensen. Um, his research interest lies in, the, uh, in exploring how quantum mechanical calculation can be used in the drug discovery process. We are very much excited to have you today, Clement, and looking forward to your talk. The first yes. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prudencia, for that for that nice introduction, um, and also, of course, for for organizing this this meeting series. Um, so I've joined a few of the um, of the past talks, and those were always always great to listen to. Um, so I hope I can I can follow up on this. Um, before I get started with my talk. Um, if you have any um, any questions that refer to something um, that that's being discussed um, at that time, uh, feel free to write those in the chat, and then we we can follow up on those immediately. If it's questions that are sort of more um, more um, up for discussion, um, please ask them later. We'll have sort of uh, fifteen minutes um, to um, to discuss those towards the end of my talk. All right, so let's get started. Um, and I hope you can all uh, see my screen. Otherwise, um, do let me know. All right, so today I'll, I'll be talking about quantum machine learning for drug-like molecules. And specifically, I'll be discussing two recent contributions from our group in that field. So first of all, why is it something um, that we're interested in? Why are we interested in finding out how we can combine those worlds of quantum mechanics um, and computer-assisted drug design. Now, principally, quantum mechanics offers a really fundamental description of um, different physical and chemical processes, right? So it gives you this really fine-grained picture, which um, is, of course, attractive to then understand um, how drugs act or design new drugs. At the same time, we know that the electronic structure of molecules is responsible for a range of different drug-relevant properties. So um, for instance, we know that um, atomic charges or bond orders play a role in protein ligand binding or that the homo lumo energy gap is relevant for um, phototoxicity or that the dipole moment can have an impact on, for instance, lipophilicity or solubility um, and also um, membrane permeability, for instance. So, that all comes with this caveat that, of course, computing quantum mechanical properties using first principles methods, such as, for instance, DFT, density functional theory, is quite expensive, especially as you move to the types of molecules that we're interested in, um, in a pharmaceutical or biological context. Right? If you think about drug-like molecules or um, natural products, microcycles, or even um, maybe the, the pocket of a protein, those are all relatively large structures. And so running QM calculations for those, um, especially if you want to do it for a larger number of them, becomes um, really quite, um, quite expensive computationally. In order to deal with this, in the last few years, this field of quantum machine learning has emerged, where people essentially try to predict QM properties rather than compute them using first principle methods. So the idea is essentially, right, um, instead of taking um, a molecule and running um, DFT calculations, for instance, to get some quantity that you're, that you're interested in, you do this for a set of molecules um, to build your training set. And then you train some type of model that learns this mapping from a molecular space to um, a QM property space um, that you want. Um, and then if you want to have QM properties for any other molecules that were not in your training set, you essentially just use that same model to make predictions. Now, this, um, this uh, progress in that field, um, I think, uh, in, in my opinion, 
still comes with two limitations that somewhat hinder um, the, the, the application of all of these um, new developments really to the world of truck design. Specifically, the first one is that so far, most, most of the developed models have focused on small model systems with limited atom type diversity. And so um, a lot of people use, for instance, the QM9 data set to train their models and, and develop their methods. And on the left here, I'm showing sort of what, a, what a, um, an average molecule from QM9 might look like compared to on the right-hand side, um, a drug that has been recently gained FDA approval. Now you can imagine that um, models trained on something like this that only have ever seen something of this complexity might struggle to then extrapolate to such much larger structures with more um, structural complexity with atom types, for instance, sulfur um, that aren't contained anywhere in this training data set. Um, and that um, and, and that might also show much more intricate sort of inter uh, sorry intramolecular interactions because of the large size of these molecules. So that's sort of the, the first um, the first point. The second point, in my opinion, is that there is somewhat of a lack of open source and easy to use implementations. A lot of those previous advances in quantum machine learning were either um, from companies. And, and so that their code wasn't open source, um, or those were sort of research level codes that aren't necessarily super easy to apply um, for, for other people all the time. So today I'll, I'll be talking about two recent contributions from our group where we try to tackle those two issues, specifically um, the QMAX data set and the um, Delta open source toolbox. And this is um, sort of the lines along which this, uh, this talk today will be structured. So diving into QMAX, um, which is a data set of quantum mechanical properties of drug-like molecules. Um, here we um, provide a range of different QM properties for um, a relatively large set of biologically relevant molecules, which we extracted from the Campbell data database. And so if, if um, we compare this to existing methods, uh, sorry, to existing um, DFT data sets that are out there, um, we see that with, Q with the 665,000 molecules, and about 2 million conformers that we have in QMAX, um, we have um, on average the uh, substantially larger molecules than those are, that are covered in existing data sets. Um, and we also provide the, these different QM properties on two different levels of theory. Um, so we're using both the semi-empirical GFN2XDB method as well as um, then uh, density functional theory. So the omega B97XD functional with the dev 2 svp cal square basis set. Additionally, the vast majority um, of those um, compounds that we, we report cover previously, um, so, so cover chemical space where previously no DFT calculations were um, readily available in any of those data sets. So we are really sort of expanding the chemical space um, to this set of truck-like biologically relevant molecules. Um, what we also see, um, and I, I found that um, in interesting to see how if you draw those molecules on this principal moment um, of inertia plot, we see that most of them, and this is actually what, what is um, commonly seen for drug-like molecules, most of them focus mainly around this um, rod disk axis. But in QMAX, we still have a number of molecules that reach more into this sort of 3D space, which more and more medicinal chemists are becoming interested in from this sort of escape from flatland um, approach that people are, um, are following. And so in, in total, um, as I mentioned, we have um, 32 different quantum mechanical properties and most of those on those two, two different levels of theory. And why this is something that is actually useful um, is what I'll be discussing a little bit in the second part of my talk. Um, also, we provide the quantum mechanical wave functions. So the density and orbital matrices for those different, um, different compounds. Um, and, and I just saw that, um, that there's a question regarding um, the, the axis labels. Um, sorry, I should explain this better. 
So um, we basically have two ratios of principal moments of inertia. So I one and two and three are the first, second and third smallest moments of inertia. And then um, those are essentially just their ratios. And um, if you plot it on a uh, plot those molecules um, on a two dimensional plot like this, this essentially um, tells you how similar to a rod-like structure or disc-like structure, right? So 1D, 2D, or 3D, like a spherical structure, your molecules would be. Right? Um, and so um, the, the exact values for those principal moment of inertia values aren't super interesting. It's more sort of where on this triangular space um, are we operating? Um, yep. And then um, there's a question as well uh, about how well those different values correlate. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a second. And if that, that question isn't answered, uh, feel free to, to ask it later in the, the Q&A. All right, um, so this is a general overview over the QMAX data set. Um, let me briefly talk you through how we created it. So as I said, we are we, using the Campbell database and we apply a set of activity filters to make sure we really only extract biologically relevant structures. We then run a washing and neutralization um, procedure and apply some additional structural filters. Um, and then we create a first low energy start confirmer using the MFF94 um, S force field. And then we use this starting conformer to run a metadynamic simulation with a root mean squared distance biasing potential. So what that means is essentially we have a potential that um, encourages this metadynamics tra uh, trajectory to explore chemical space that is relatively different to the, um, the screenshots or to the trajectory that we have already followed. And so we take uh, snapshots from this trajectory in 50 femtosecond intervals, which gives us a total of 100 such snapshots, which we then cluster in three clusters and from each we take the lowest energy structure. And what this gives us are essentially um, three samples from this conformational space, which um, are relatively diverse so that we have a good coverage um, from this space. Right? Of course, there's um, a trade-off between how many different uh, conformations do you include versus um, the computational cost associated with that. Now, we then take those three conformers, we run a geometry optimization, followed by um, some geometry checks where we um, ensure that this geometry optimization didn't converge to any unrealistic optima. Um, so for instance, we compare the resulting bond length to experimental reference values. We analyze the planarity of aromatic rings um, and, and things like this. Um, and then for those compounds, and that's the, the vast, vast majority that pass these filters, um, we keep those as our final optimized conformance. And so that would be three per compound for, for most of them, apart from the few where we um, had, to, had to discard a structure. And then for those optimized conformers, we use both that semi-empirical method and density functional theory to run, the, um, run those calculations that give us eventually both local and global properties, um, as well as the wave functions and um, thermodynamic data. And then we package all of this up um, as the uh, QMAX data set um, in a uh, relatively easily accessible format. Um, and I think there was another question in the chat asking why three clusters? Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's really this, this trade-off, right? Of course, more, more clusters and accordingly more uh, more confirmations would be would be better, but also more expensive. And so we sort of array, uh, arrived at this middle ground. All right. Um, and so this are, these are just three of those uh, properties that we have on, on different levels of theory, which I picked out. So on the y-axis, you have the semi-empirical method plotted against the DFT calculations on the x-axis. And what we see is that it really depends on the property that you're looking at, um, how well these two methods agree with each other, right? So for instance, and that, that makes sense intuitively, for instance, properties that are more influenced by the 
geometry, so simply the nuclear positions of the molecules, such as the dipole moment, that agrees really well between those two methods. Whereas, for instance, electronic properties, such as um, the homolumo gap, which are more influenced by the electronic nature, and thus um, more influenced by the um, simplifications that a semi-empirical method needs to make to um, increase the computational efficiency, um, these, um, these structures do not align, uh, or, or for, for these ones, the two, two methods do not agree quite as well. Now, there's sort of three use cases that we see for the QMAX data set. And the first one is um, in a similar fashion to how people have been using, for instance, QM9 before, which is predicting drug like, uh, pr predicting QM properties of drug like molecules, right? With the difference, of course, that um, here we have a larger array of QM properties, we have a larger number of molecules, and most importantly, we expand this chemical space to that set of drug like molecules and of substantially larger molecules as well. The second point is delta learning. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll just say for now, um, essentially QMAX is the first data set that really enables this, um, the application of this delta learning paradigm. And what exactly that is, I'll, I'll be talking about in a second. And then uh, lastly, another use case could be predicting the wave function because we are um, providing those density and orbital matrices. And of course, then all of this in this context of um, these are all molecules for which biological annotations, so assay measurements and so on, exist in the, in the CAMEL database. So you could then um, take those QM properties and try to relate them to some biological quantity, um, like some assay readout that you might be interested in. So I think there, there might really be some, some very interesting avenues of research um, that are made possible through this. And it's, it's great to see that already for those first two use cases, um, there are already uh, applications out there. The first one is uh, Hannes's 3D Infomax, um, where they're using uh, QMAX as a pre-training data set. Um, also, again, then for, for QM property prediction. And the second one, of course, is um, my, my jump point to the, to the second part of this talk, um, which is the Delta Toolbox um that that we that we built so with this i'll um i'll jump into the second the second part of this talk um so delta uh, again an open source delta quantum machine learning toolbox for medicinal chemistry um so here's an overview of, of what we're doing here essentially delta takes in a three-dimensional confirmation of the molecule it uses a 3d message passing neural network to then output a range of seven different quantum mechanical properties. And those are both global properties, so, uh, so, so molecular properties, um, such as um, the formation energy and then orbital energies and the dipole, as well as local properties, so partial charges and bond waters. And we either do this in this delta or direct learning scheme, which is uh, what I'll finally get to explaining now. Um, for now, just know that if we do delta learning, we'll internally run um, that uh, semi-empirical baseline calculation. All right, so this delta learning scheme is based on this general accuracy versus cost trade-off that many of you might be familiar, uh, familiar about, which is um, in the space of quantum mechanics, you have a set of different methods ranging from sort of really computationally inexpensive, but also quite inaccurate force field methods, all the way up to sort of the gold standard coupled cluster methods that are very, very accurate, but at the same time, incredibly expensive. And just to get you, uh, give you a feeling for what, what I mean by incredibly expensive, um, this is, um, these are QM calculations for this relatively modestly sized um, phenyl alanine complex with a with a um, calcium ion. And as you can see, the, those force field methods, they're in the sub-second range. And then the different DFT methods um, are sort of on the order of um, a few minutes to a few hours. Um, Semi-empirical would be somewhere in between. And then that gold standard here, we were really talking um, on the order of multiple weeks for such a small molecule. Right? So you can easily see that how 
how inachievable that becomes um, if you want to move to even larger molecules or to a larger number of them. Right, so with this general accuracy versus cost trade-off, what people have found in the past um, is, say you're interested in, for instance, getting DFT, value, uh, DFT values for a set of molecules. Now, it turns out that you actually get more accurate predictions um, if instead of trying to directly um, predict those values, you only predict the difference, so the delta, between a lower cost method, say something's gonna be empirical, and that level of theory which you are interested in, right? So essentially you train a model that only predicts this difference rather than um, the property itself, which would be why uh, DFT, which you're interested in. And then at inference time, you are simply doing this prediction, you're running the lower cost method, and then you're adding both of those together to finally get your value um, that you're interested in. And so in the past, again, people have seen that um, this increases their predictive ac accuracy. And so we were interested in using this, um, this delta learning paradigm, which of course um, is clearly directly enabled by QMAX because you, for all of those molecules, have those different properties at those two dif uh, different levels of theory. And so um, again, we trained our models um, on, uh, on QMAX to approximate those DFT reference values. Um, and we do this either using delta learning, where we use the semi-empirical baseline um, as, as, as our baseline, or we also uh, train directly, uh, train models which directly predict um, that value. And so essentially based on whether we want to do this uh, in delta learning scheme or not, we would run internally this additional um, semi-empirical calculation. All right, um, briefly a peek under the hood. Um, so we're using a 3D message passing neural network, as I mentioned, and we achieve E3 invariance of this network um, by encoding the diatomic distances between, um, between the atoms using um, a, a Fourier style encoding. And by using those diatomic uh, distances so, so relative distances rather than uh, dis uh, rather than Cartesian coordinates, we get E three invariance, which means that um, if we rotate or translate our input molecule, our outputs don't change, which is what you want, right? Um, at the same time, that also means that if we reflect our uh, our input molecule, our outputs also don't change, right? Because all the diatomic distances stay the same. And once again, this is a property that is desirable in this case, because all the output uh, properties that we predict, um, those are all non-chiral properties, right? And so both the NGMS would uh, share, for instance, the, the exact same formation energy. So it makes sense that um, these models do not differentiate between them. All right, um, yep, and this is essentially just that, that message and uh, passing scheme. So um, we uh, initially, as I mentioned, use diatomic distances um, as edge features and simply the atom type um, as, the, as the node features. And then we um, compute directed messages on the edges on a, on a fully connected graph, by the way. Um, we aggregate those messages per node and then update our node features based on the previous node features and those aggregated, um, aggregated messages. And then finally, in the readout phase um, for those global properties, so for the formation energy, which is an, um, an extensive quantity, right, which depends on the system size, we use some pooling, whereas for the other, uh, for the intensive properties, we use mean pooling. And then for those local properties, so charges and bond orders, um, we simply use their respective um, node or edge features um, to then predict um, those quantities, those local quantities that we're interested in. All right, so let's take a look at some results. And what I'm plotting here for those different properties on the y-axis in red is either the delta predicted values or in blue, the semi-empirical values, which is sort of what you've seen earlier from QMAX versus on the x-axis, the DFT reference values. 
Um, and then of course, a perfect prediction would sort of lie on this y equals x line. Um, and first thing that, that you can see, um, we have for all the properties are substantially better at approximating our DFT reference values using those um, predictions from the Delta toolbox. And also um, maybe to, to again, explain this Delta learning um, scheme, what we're doing here visually is rather than, uh, for instance, here, rather than trying to predict this point, what our model is trying to do is sort of take this point here from the semi-empirical baseline and drag it up to um, the y equals x line, right? So what we're learning is this difference here. And then we simply add that to um, the semi-empirically calculated value to then finally get our, um, our, our output. So um, also looking at, at the numbers, um, we see that across the board, the Delta Learning Toolbox clearly uh, approximates our DFT values better than the semi-empirical baseline does, um, which makes sense because that's, that's what it's trained to do, right? Um, and we also see that in general, Delta Learning does better than direct learning for most properties. Now I say for most properties um, because of course there's this sort of interesting um, case of the homo energies where actually delta learning seems to seems to hurt us a little bit right we're getting a lower error if we directly learn this quantity rather than if we try to delta learn it and also if you look at the other quantities um, and this was something we became quite interested in um, this difference doesn't always um, seem to be constant right for instance for the formation energy there's quite a substantial difference um, between the error for delta learning and direct learning. But then for some other quantities, say for the partial charges, the difference is substantially smaller, right? So the, the relative difference is a lot smaller. So how come? Um, and we looked at this and ended up with um, this plot, which I'll briefly explain before I'm showing any, any points on it. Um, so essentially the x-axis, is the correlation between our semi-empirical method and that, um, that DFT method, right? So how, how well do those two methods correlate with one another? And then on, then on the y-axis, I'm showing the relative performance advantage of delta learning over direct learning, right? So the normalized difference in their error. So anything below zero means direct learning has a lower error and anything above it means uh, Delta learning is doing better and sort of by how much, right? All right, so let's plot this. Um, and we were quite excited to see um, that such a clear trend emerges across those different properties. And that this, of course, confirms this intuitive understanding that um, the better those two methods correlate, the more information essentially your semi-empirical method provides on the, um, on the reference method, on the DFT method the more beneficial data learning becomes, right? So for, for, um, for properties that correlate really well on the right-hand side of the plot, you get up to sort of 40% of relative performance advantage um, of delta learning over direct learning. Whereas on the other side of the plot, um, for, for properties where that correlation between our two methods isn't that good, you actually get much less advantage of delta learning, or even at some point for the case of the homo energies, the model is actually getting more confused um, by, by having to predict this delta. And again, that makes sense sort of, if you take this to the extreme and assume that those two methods wouldn't correlate at all, then essentially what you're trying to learn by predicting this, this difference is just random noise, right? And then of course your model, your model would be doing terribly um, whereas if those two methods correlate really well, again, then this is super helpful for Delta learning and it would show, um, show great performance advantage of a direct learning. Another thing we looked at were learning curves. So plotting the, the uh, test set error, always measured on three different uh, test sets, but always on the, on the same three um, against the training set size. Now, the first thing that you see, and I think that shouldn't be surprising to anyone, is your tested error decreases as you increase your training set size. That makes sense. Um, what, you all, what we also see is that this performance advantage of delta learning, which, which is those blue lines, 
Um, this is reproduced for most training set sizes, right? So even in a low data regime, um, Delta learning is already quite helpful um, over, over direct learning. Again, that makes some sense because the model has some initial idea um, on um, sort of where those values um, are expected to lie. And then um, again, we, we sort of see how that performance difference isn't uh, uniform across those different, um, different properties um, as before. And we also investigated for the intensive molecular properties, so for the different orbital energies and for the dipole moment. Um, we investigated whether multitask learning might be helpful for our model's predictive accurate, uh, accuracy. And so those are those dashed lines. And what we found is that generally, yes, um, it tends to be helpful. Um, this isn't perfectly um, showing up for all the properties for all the learning, uh, for all the training set sizes. But in general, um, training these models in a multitask fashion gives us a little bit, um, again, increased predictive accuracy. And that makes sense, again, particularly for those different orbital energies, since those are, of course, quite uh, related to one another. And so it makes sense that forcing the model to learn an internal representation that is useful across those different tasks um, would indeed lead to a lower test set error. Um, and I think there was one question popping up here. Um, yep. Um, so this is indeed um, uh, random test sets, um, though we put all the different conformers for one molecule into the same test set, right? So you wouldn't have one conformer in the test set and one conformer in the training set, which would of course um, make it far too easy for that model. Um, but we didn't investigate so far any scaffold splits or something like this. That's a good question. Um, yep, how does Delta compare performance with transformer uh, graph former architectures? Um, yep, so we based this um, on the EGNN framework, which at the time that we developed those models was among those um, architectures that were doing really well. I don't think it's state of the art, state of the art anymore, at least on QM9 for energy predictions, but it's quite close to it. Um, so, um, and, and we actually tested our models as well on QM9, just to um, ensure that that, that was correctly implemented and uh, were able to reproduce their results. Um, but of course, there wasn't that much testing down QMAX yet. And we haven't uh, specifically benchmarked this again, uh, this against um, other existing architectures um, on, on QMAX. What we've seen though, is when we check this against QM9, the error, at least for formation energies on QMAX tends to be higher um, on the test set, which does make some sense because you have those much more complex molecules, right? Where it might not be so straightforward to learn this. Um, ah, okay, graph formers do not use 3D conformation. That's a good point. So you wouldn't want to use that. Um, oh, I wasn't, um, wasn't aware of that specific architecture. Um, yep, all right. And then uh, one last result I wanted to share is since we are predicting VBAC bond orders for those individual bonds in our QMAX molecules, both for covalent bonds, but also for intramolecular non-covalent bonds, we were interested whether we can extrapolate from this to non-covalent interactions in biomolecules. And it turns out we can. So uh, on the left-hand side, we have a, a beta turn on the left-hand side, uh, on the right-hand side, an, an alpha helix with a couple of, uh, of non-covalent interactions highlighted. And as you can see, the, um, the predicted bond orders um, that our models output are quite close to those uh, calculated with DFT. So the model seems to be able to quite well extrapolate into this space as well. Um, and we've also seen this um, for, for intermolecular non-covalent interactions um, rather than intramolecular ones. Um, is integrating three confirmations critical for quantum related tasks? Yes, absolutely. Um, so you can um, get some approximations um, to 3D information from um, a 2D graph, for instance. Um, but if you don't differentiate between the individual confirmations, 
um, you can't capture sort of, for instance, the changes in partial charges as two atoms get closer to each other in space and what happens to their, their respective um, electronic environments. And you also, for instance, couldn't judge um, the uh, relative conformational energies, which is quite important to judge, for instance, um, energy changes, uh, so, sorry, um, which is important to, uh, to check which conformer might be the more stable one and so forth. Um, so yes, including 3D conformations is important if you want to get to really accurate predictions. Um, all right, so I've mentioned a little bit how this is supposed to be easy to use. Um, so let me try and demonstrate this. Um, so I'll jump into um, an IPython session here. And first of all, we are interfacing with OpenBabel um, so that we can um, support a wide array of different uh, input file formats. And for now, I'll just um, start from a smile string um, for Paxlovet. Um, and by the way, this is, this is what that looks like. Right, so it's um, by no means um, something that you would find in QM9, for instance. It's a relatively complex molecule. Um, all right, so let's create this molecule simply from its smile string. Um, all right, and then uh, we'll import our main our main class, which is this Delta calculator, um, and have some. Uh, some mercy on my my old laptop. All right, so let's initialize that um, and the calculator um, and the main argument um, that we have to pass here is do we want delta learning or not? So let's say we do want to do delta learning um, and let's get some predictions for this for our molecule. And here we are. All right, so before we look at the predictions, briefly what has what has happened here. First off, um, we're being told that uh, this uh, toolbox generated some uh, force field coordinates for us and added hydrogens as well, which of course we need to do if we just generated a molecule from a smile string. Maybe a more common use case for you might be that you already have a confirmation lying around and you want properties for a specific confirmation and then you just load this. Um, and if your molecule has 3D information, we won't mess with that. Um, but you can also internally optimize it if you want using XTB. All right, anyways, next thing that happens is we run this baseline because we want to do um, a delta calculation. And then we run the individual models for those different endpoints um, because we didn't specify that we only wanted certain endpoints. All right, um, and then uh, you could also easily do this, for instance, for an entire SDF file or for a list of molecules, if you had those lying around, that's when sort of those progress bars become useful. So let's look at the predictions. Um, so first off, you see you have the different um, molecular properties, and then you have the different feedback bond orders um, with the respective atom indices to which um, they belong. You can, again, get the open bubble molecule object back to figure out which atom is which, and incorporate this into your workflow. Um, and for instance, here you see, right, this would be one of those non-covalent interactions, just simply judging from the, from the bond order that we see here. Um, and then uh, you also get an array of the individual atomic charges. Right? And you could do the same thing um, if you want to make a new uh, calculator. Um, well, I guess the, the, the idea probably is, is key in the uh, sake of time, but if you essentially just say delta is false, then we won't run that semi-empirical baseline, but we'd rather, um, we'd rather direct on our models. All right. Um, so I think there were some more questions, but those are nothing that I would, uh, that are directly related here. All right, so let's just, jump back into the presentation. Um, so if you want to get your hands on this and want to uh, play with this yourself, um, head over to our GitHub page and you can also quite e easily install the whole thing um, via Conda. Um, and then with regards to all the different options, um, there's, um, there's some extensive documentation and some tutorial notebooks. Um, so we hope that it's, it's um, easy to get started with these models.
Um, all right, to, to finish this up, um, I think the main novelty of this work is that here we're combining a large data set of quantum properties of drug-like molecules with a 3D, uh, 3D message passing neural network. And we're expanding this delta machine learning uh, prediction landscape by a set of different quantum properties, right? So far, delta machine learning was mainly done for energies. Now we expand this also to orbital energies, dipoles, and those um, charges and point orders as well. Um, we package everything up into a uh, user-friendly uh, toolbox where we provide an open source package both with a command line and then Python, uh, the Python API. Um, and as I was hopefully just able to show you, you can get those DFT level properties um, with just a few lines of code. And also importantly, um, I didn't mention this, um, this took like a fraction of a second um, or it does take a fraction of a second if you do it for multiple molecules. Whereas if you run this molecule through um, a DFT calculation that I was showing you, um, this would probably take you, I would guess maybe an hour, something on that order of magnitude depends on, on the resources you throw at it. So you really get access to those very good approximations as we showed to DFT reference values at a fraction of the cost. Um, and we do hope that um, the combination of QMAX and this Delta toolbox will enable the, or will help to enable the large scale application of quantum chemistry applications in medicinal chemistry. Um, one limitation that I should mention is sort of the applicability domain of those models, um, specifically because QMAX was built for drug like molecules. The focus here really is on medicinal chemistry, right? So if you try to throw um, some transition metal complexes or some solid state chemicals um, into the Delta toolbox, we'll, we just give you an error and say, no, that's, that's not what this can do, um, rather than just give you meaningless numbers. Um, yeah. um, good question about the uncertainty estimations. Um, and no, those are currently not implemented. I think that might be a very interesting future direction. Um, and uh, that's a good point in the sense that um, it's really something that I think a lot of people um, are very interested in getting. And there's a question regarding differences between QMAX and GEOM. That's also a good question. Um, the main difference is that GEOM, while it sort of focuses on a similar chemical space, um, is entirely uh, semi-empirical values, right? So uh, GEOM is using um, GFN XTB. Uh, GFN2 XTB for all their properties. Um, and uh, as you showed earlier, those are not necessarily always great approximations to DFT uh, values. Um, yep. And there's some questions that I think we can cover in the Q&A in a second. Um, so for now with this, uh, let me wrap up by uh, saying uh, thanks to my collaborators. Uh, so Gisbert, Ken, Jose, uh, and Marcus, and also to um, the Scholarship Fund of the Swiss Chemical Industry for, for their funding. Um, and of course, uh, to all of you for joining this talk today. Um, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. It was a great presentation and uh, very easy to follow. Um, for anyone who has a question in the audience, I will invite you to just open your mic and directly jump in. Again, do you want to open your mic? Okay, don't go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the great presentation. It's uh, very interesting, and uh, I've used two months in the past, and I think it's a very good data set. Uh, one question I have is that now that you have a, a deep learning based model to help predict the DFTs and mm -hmm. um, allow the optimization of structure to be uh, to be faster and to be better, um, is there any plan of um, extending the QMOX data set using, instead of using just semi-empirical approach for the first estimation, use also your, um, your learned model for a better estimation so that you can generate more conformers in, le in less time and basically um, do some sort of active learning. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're not really planning to extend QMOX itself using um, those Delta models. Um, 
because um, I, I guess what then ends up happening is if, if you train then on sort of this enlarged data set, then you're learning the output of a model, right? So it's sort of like a model stacking um, approach. And at some point, I think you're running into this risk of, um, of course, for none of those predictions, you know, you know exactly how accurate each individual one is if you don't know a computed, a calculated ground truth. Um, and so that, that might sort of pose this risk of you um, slowly somehow drifting outside the um, applicability domain without necessarily noticing it. Um, with regards to active learning, um, so, so one important point to, to note is um, uh, Delta doesn't include any conformer generation ability itself, but of course you could generate a conformer in whatever way um, you want and then, for instance, compute its energy using QMAX, uh, uh, using Delta. Um, and perhaps this could be used in some active learning context. We ourselves are not doing anything uh, in this regard at the moment. Okay, thank you. And uh, of course, I didn't mean to use to expand QMUG using uh, the energies uh, yeah. predicted, but to mm -hmm. use the energy predicted to optimize the DFT structure faster. Uh, uh, which okay. is, in some yep. sense uh, would be the active learning question that you answered. Right, right, right. Okay, sorry, yeah. I, I, I missed a question then. Um, I think that can be useful. Um, it depends a little bit on um, the exact DFT um, implementation that you're using. Sort of, what does this need as a starting point um, to get the calculation started? Okay. Uh, thanks a lot again for the great presentation. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a few questions in the chat. Maybe you could take them before we go to Nathan. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Um, all right, let me check. Um, so I think the last one, um, and do let me know if, if I missed your question. Um, would it be better for using SE3 equivariant neural networks, such as uh, tensor field neural net networks? Um, and we'll give the same property for chiral isomers. Um, I, I was mentioning this earlier, how it's actually not problematic, but rather a feature in this case, right? It's, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, because all those properties that we're predicting here, um, those are properties where both um, chiral isomers, so both enantiomers would have the, the same property, right? So it's something like um, the formation energy or the different orbital energies. But of course, um, what you're alluding to is these types of networks become problematic if you try to predict some, um, some quantity which does depend on the chirality of your molecule, so which differs between different enantiomers. And of course, a good example might be sort of different drug-like molecules and their interaction with, um, with a target, right? Um, and then um, question for Q&A. Um, uh, Claire, am I saying that correctly? Do you want to uh, ask that yourself? I can also read that out. Um... Uh, hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm happy to ask the question. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, if you've thought about uh, implementation on a future quantum computer, because I, I think that's what a lot of people have been thinking about recently is uh, quantum mm -hmm. chemistry on, on future quantum computers, uh, which could be like a near term application. So if you've got already the, the chemical um, quantum information, you could probably map, map it easily onto the, an input quantum state in a quantum machine learning algorithm. Um, I don't know if you've uh, thought about how that might work with your methods. Mm -hmm. um, so super exciting question. Um, I have to admit um, quantum computing itself isn't really an, expert, an area of expertise of mine. Um, so no, we, ha we haven't thought of this. Um, it, it sounds super exciting, but uh, again, I couldn't really make a make a qualified statement about this. Sorry. Okay, no worries. But thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Um, and then, what is the advantage of QMAX compared to an even larger data set like uh, is that PubChem QM four MB two? Both are based on is is it PubChem QM uh, Eugen? Um, do, do you want to elaborate this? I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm reading the abbreviation correctly or if that's a different data set um, than what I'm imagining. And yes, it's the OGB data set. Uh, the, the what, sorry. The, is it, it uh, PubChem? Data. The, the PubChem QC data set or a different one? 
Uh, just to, to confirm here, the PCQM for MV2 is yes. the PopCam QC data set ah, yeah. that has been um, modified to make it more like uh, machine learning friendly and uh, ah, compatible yeah. with the PyTorch geometric and DGL. Ah, okay, okay. Gotcha. So they're, right. they're the same. Yep. Okay. So, so Popkin QC. Yep. Um, that's that's a good question. Um, so, um, I think Popkin QC is probably the data set that is the most similar to ours. Um, an important. Um, let's see if I can can get back here without this taking ages. Um, so, one. Yeah, um, so one important difference is um, the set of properties um, that we that we provide. Um, another one would be the uh, the uh, usability of QMAX for data learning because we have those two different levels of theory. Um, and the third important one would be that um, a very large chunk of QMAX isn't included in PubCam QC. So again, we're covering a different chemical space um, from uh, than, than PubCam QC. But of course, PubCam QC um, then again covers a, a, a different chemical space as well um, or covers different molecules. Um, yeah. Um, um, if not mis yep. uh, in what format do you provide the wave functions? Um, so those are serialized NumPy files, um, which um, is the format that that Sci4, which is what we're using. So an open source um, quantum chemistry package. Um, that's how how it's saving those to disk. Um, but for instance, if you're more used to uh, working with Gaussian, you can easily use Sci4 to convert those to um, Gaussian checkpoint files, so um, FCHK files, um, and then then work with those um, if that's uh, this better fits your workflow. Um, oh yeah, sorry, yeah, that's another comment on this thing. Um, okay. I think uh, now we can. Um, hmm? Nathan, do you mind um, unmuting yourself and asking a question? Sure. Yeah. Th thanks very much for a great talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could maybe discuss a little bit. Uh, your method compared to something like OrbNet um, and right. So sort of like the corrections on top of type binding that you're doing versus sort of using the outputs of type binding as inputs to a network, uh, right? Like directly as featureization or, you know, mm -hmm. sort of whatever OrbNet is doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's another good point. Um, and I think uh, similarly to pop, how PubCam QC was quite what well, was the, the most similar um, work so far to QMAX? I would say that OpNet is probably uh, one of the most similar works to, to Delta. Um, and so, right, so, so an important uh, difference, as you mentioned, is um, in OpNet, the output from a semi empirical baseline, so from, from XTB, is used as a featureization for their, for their input graph. Um, rather than sort of as a baseline from which you predict a delta. Um, I think both, both methods are, are quite interesting um, in their own right, and you get sort of different, um, different insights into how your molecular structure um, influences a specific quantum chemical output, right? Um, the, like a, a, a big difference between Delta and um, WarpNet would be that um, WarpNet sort of falls into the second um, category that I was mentioning earlier in that um, in that um, that's uh, software developed by a company, right? And so it's not not open source, which um, of course is perfectly fine. So that's how their model works. Um, but um, Delta is sort of something that anyone can get their hand on and modify in whatever way um, you like, right? Great, thank you. Sure. Any more questions? Uh, maybe, maybe one more. It's a bit less directly related to the quantum part of things, but mm -hmm. uh, near the end, you mentioned that you actually compute the applic applicability domain of the model and throw an error if a molecule is outside of that applicability domain. Uh -huh. I believe. Um, so it's not it's not directly a computation of the applicability domain. Um, so so what what I meant was if there's if, if you provide an input where we know that um, we definitely cannot give you a reasonable output for, we'll throw an error. And the way we do this is simply by some structural checks, right? So for instance, if you give us something that has a, a molecule type that's not in QMAX, right? If you have 
I don't know, some, some transition metal in your compound will tell you, um, hey, that's not what our models are trained for, right? But we, we, we don't do anything where we compute like a similarity to, to our training set or something like this and, and judge it based on this. So it's really a structural filter that we are applying.